This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, we turn now to look at how the 20th anniversary of protests in Seattle that shut down a meeting of the World Trade Organization also marked the time when the first independent media center came to life. Amidst the clouds of tear gas, hundreds of volunteer reporters documented what unfolded. That week, IndieMedia.org received 1.5 million visitors, more than CNN, and it produced a daily video report and a newspaper. It was the first node in a global citizen journalism movement. We're going to meet some of the indie media activists in a moment. But first, this excerpt from Showdown in Seattle. It was produced for Deep Dish TV by the Seattle Indie Media Center and scores of media activists. In the clip, we get a tour of the first, the very first, independent media center, beginning with Jeff Perlstein, one of the founders of Seattle Indie Media. The main motivation for us uh, starting the Independent Media Center was folks on the ground here in Seattle recognizing the importance of this issue and also all, that all these tremendous, brilliant, articulate people were coming from all over the world to speak truth to power here, to confront globalization and its anti-democratic agenda. One of the critical aspects to uh, this center is that it's been a clearinghouse of information for lots of individuals, not only who live in Seattle, but have been coming in from around the country and around the globe um, to participate in the events this week. And uh, we are providing a base of operation for journalists and others who are going out into the streets and capturing the content, editing the content, and then distributing it over the internet, over satellite, over faxes. Literally around the world. But we have to find our own ways to get the message out. So because the revolution will not be televised by the corporate media, we hope that the information that has been presented to you by the alternative media is one that you will learn. What's what's really important to note about the whole center that's taking place is that um, it's 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 fairly unprecedented. We've got teams that are covering video, we've got teams that are covering covering print, we have a newspaper actually being published every day out of this center. The the blind spot, which is this paper. It's the paper that the Independent Media Center puts out every day um, during the WTO. And it's basically like a 11 by 17 fold over that's front and back, and which is pretty much all we can afford to do. I'm sure we could fill a lot more. Of that's an excerpt from Showdown in Seattle about the first independent media center that opened 20 years ago this week. Well, for more, we're joined by several guests. In Seattle, Jill Friedberg, who is co-founder of the Seattle Independent Media Center and co-produced the Seattle WTO documentary, This Is What Democracy Looks Like. We're also joined here in studio with uh, Rick Rowley. Uh, uh, he joins us. Uh, he's an Oscar-nominated filmmaker and independent journalist with Midnight Films. And he co-directed that film with Jill. Anne in Houston, Tish Stringer and Renee Feltz are co-organizers of the 20th anniversary Indie Media Encuentro that's taking place this weekend at the Rice Media Center. Tish is film program manager at Rice, author of a book on Indie Media called Move, Guerrilla Films, Collaborative Modes and the Tactics of Radical Media Making. Renee, at the Seattle WTO protests, then joined with Tish and others to found the Houston Independent Media Center, longtime Democracy Now! producer and reporter including for The Independent, the newspaper that grew out of the New York City indie media. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! Jill Freeberg, we're going to go to you first. You're right there in Seattle. You, too, this weekend, have a large gathering uh, honoring this 20th anniversary of indie media. Talk about that indie media center um, that was right there in the middle of Seattle. Uh, the fact that indiemedia.org was getting more hits than CNN.com, as CNN was saying there are no, um, uh, there are no uh, rubber bullets being fired. And here was Indy Media showing pictures of people holding the rubber bullets, Jill. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that was really amazing about that moment was that the physical space on the ground of the Independent Media Center, which really came together in a couple of months before the WTO came to town, 
um, that the capacity of that independent media center on the ground, combined with the reach of IndieMedia.org, which was, if not the first, one of the very first open publishing platforms ever. It was a new and unprecedented thing that independent journalists could share their content directly to a website without an editor in between them and, and the site. And the combination of those two factors um, really facilitated independent media not just providing a strong alternative to the corporate media, but uh, interrupting the narrative that the corporate media was trying to construct about what was happening in the streets of, of Seattle that week. And I think another really important piece of that is that, on the ground, the independent media center was not just a press center. It wasn't just a space with computer and computers and internet access. It was a space of collaboration. Um, it was a space of training. A lot of people who just came through the door looking for a way to help out by the end of the week knew how to edit a radio segment or uh, write and publish a print article. And all of that came together because people around the world, but also on the ground in Seattle, anticipated ahead of time that the corporate media coverage would be slanted, narrow, and inadequate, and also anticipated that hundreds of independent journalists from around the world would need a space, infrastructure, collaboration, um, and support. And we anticipated a little bit of what happened, but we were all also quite surprised at not just at what happened in the streets of Seattle, but what happened inside the independent media center in terms of response and numbers of people who came through the door to, to participate. And Jill, were you, were you further surprised <laughs> after the week of, 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 of protests about the, the, the flowering of these independent media centers really around the world? Could you talk about that as well? Yeah, 100 percent surprised. I mean, if there were others there who, who had expected that, uh, you know, I didn't know about it, because we all uh, had really not anticipated that independent media centers would start popping up all over the world. Initially, they were popping up where big protests were happening, but then eventually they were just uh, taking shape in towns literally around the world where people felt like an independent media center could serve their community's needs. And it was a really important uh, experience to learn on the fly what did that mean to be um, connected through values and practice, but not in the same room together, because it was sort of like a testing ground for social media. Again, this was unprecedented that people would be more or less doing the same kind of work all around the world, but only connected for the most part through the internet. So it was very hard. There were a lot of lessons learned, but it also created a really important network of independent journalists who, when they were in the same room, could support each other, protect each other, share material, share equipment. Um, a lot of people who participated in those independent media centers had their work facilitated when they had to go to another country to, to do some reporting or make a film. They would land there, and it was the indie media people who would be there and of course, for them first, providing whatever they needed. What made this more stunning, this accomplishment, is that they were doing this as they were choking on tear gas. I want to turn to footage from the Seattle <clears throat> Independent Media Center that shows the night in 1999 when Seattle police and riot gear attempted to enter the offices of Indy Media. After Indy Media journalists kept police from coming in, officers surrounded the door, blocked access to the building, denying reporters entry. Can you just give me some kind of idea of when we might be able to go back in there? People are working to deadlines, you know? I have a... Is everybody waiting to get back in there? I think that's so. What we're doing? Yeah. Well, let us, let us get a few people out of there, and then we'll get you in. How's that sound? Dubious, isn't it? Very what? Dubious. Dubious? Yeah. That you, that you, that you feel the need to come. I'm giving you, Rick. I'm talking to you. ACLU is suing the city of Seattle for infringement of freedom of speech. And now we're going to go to another clip right outside the Indy Media Center. Uh, to get the story out. So what, are these people under arrest? Right. 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 
it, it's a press center. It's an independent press center. And it's, it's the only like, kind of central block that seems to be locked down. I mean, is that... It seems like more than a coincidence. I mean, what are, are you... I mean... You can't go by, sir. So that was, that last person was Rick Rowley demanding to know why they're going into the Indy Media Center. Um, uh, I was also standing outside following the police who were ahead of me, looking like robocops. What I didn't realize—of course, I did see it, but I wasn't thinking about it—is they were all wearing gas masks. I was behind them, coughing, broadcasting to WBAI on the telephone. I could hardly get my breath. I didn't have a gas mask. Rick, you were pushing uh, uh, to ask why they were targeting the Indy Media Center. Ultimately, as they tried to push their way in, Dennis Moynihan of Democracy Now! was inside the Indy Media Center reporting to the press. As they were trying to get in, they actually took a hose to tear gas the inside of the center. Rick Rowley, you are the co-producer with Jill of uh, What Democracy Looks Like. It could have been called What Democracy Smells Like. <laughs> It's amazing to see that footage. I have, I actually have never seen that clip uh, of me outside the Independent Media Center. But it was, uh, it was really, uh, I, I can't express what an amazing, you know, week it was for all of us. I mean, that was a moment when, uh, you know, when change to us really felt like it was impossible. Um, the kind of global corporate order seemed inevitable and invincible. NAFTA had just been signed by Clinton. The Democratic Party, such as it was, was fully recuperated by financial capital. The union movement had been beat on up over more than a decade. The national liberation movements in Latin America had been murdered in the mountains. And then, outside of camera range, resistance had been building. Uh, and it first, you know, appeared to us in uh, um, 1994 when the Zapatistas rose up in Chiapas, Mexico. But when that movement exploded, Exploded into the streets in Seattle. It was uh, it was a shock to all of us. And Rick, you you mentioned on a Friday night at the event we had here in New York that you almost didn't go to Seattle, right? That it was a, a last minute decision on your part. Did you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we um, uh, when our small team arrived there, we were we weren't really expecting much. We ended up there because we uh, we'd met Jeff Perlstein and some of the organizers of Seattle. On, we were on tour with a film called Zapatista that we'd made over a couple of years uh, in southern Mexico. And uh, in Austin, we met uh, Jeff and some of the organizers of uh, of Indie Media. And I think I think, you know, one of the genius of what Jeff did and Jill, who convened this kind of amazing collaborative video space, is that they didn't uh, — it, it was the same genius of the movement itself, um, that, you know, it, it convened a space and invited people in as participants, not as uh, not as supporters, um, not as uh, not as followers, but we were all as collectives invited in to find a space and to work together. And I've never I've worked in all sorts of different television environments since then. I've never been in a place that was uh, that had so little ego and such a shared kind of sense of purpose. It was. Really, yeah, a transformational moment for and me. And amazing what was happening outside, also, in that you had the Teamsters and Turtles together, right? You had the AFL-CIO. They decide to march in the streets, led by John Sweeney, then president of the AFL-CIO, thousands of people, with environmentalists, high school kids. You had uh, uh, José Beauvais, the French farmer, farmers from around the world, doctors and nurses, saying, you cannot overturn the laws of democratically elected legislatures. Uh, to pass corporate-friendly laws that could jeopardize our health. Well, as we continue to look at the 20th anniversary of the Battle of Seattle, we now turn to Houston, where we're joined by Tish Stringer and Renee Feltz, who are co-organizers of the 20th anniversary Indie Media Encuentro that takes place this weekend at the Rice Media Center. Renee was at the Seattle WTO protest and then joined with Tish and others to found the Houston Independent Media Center. She's a longtime Democracy Now! producer and reporter, and, and for, including for The Independent, a newspaper that grew out of New York City indie media. Uh, so I'd like to start with Renee. Uh, tell us about the the uh, the conference you're holding and, uh, and also a little bit about your experience in the developing the Houston Independent Media Centers after Seattle. Thank you, Juan and Amy. It's so great to be on from Houston the Petro Metro. I left Houston in 1999, in November, as a young anarchist and headed up to Seattle, Washington for the WTO protest on a bus. 
On my way up there, no one knew what the World Trade Organization was. Uh, on my way back, everyone knew. Um, in Seattle, I was radicalized as I watched my country turn into a police state. We saw all the footage of the robocops, the police, the police uh, not just tear gassing media centers, but many of us exercising our right to free speech in the streets. And when we didn't back down, it was so inspirational for me. Uh, I learned so much about tactical organizing, and I also learned a lot about how uh, the indie media concept of don't hate the media, be the media. I came back to Houston and, uh, as they say, stepped off the curb and back into the street and worked with people like Tish Stringer and many others here in town to found our own Houston Indie Media Center. Um, one of my favorite things about it was how we did do sort of daily news, but we also were ready to gear up for convergences similar to mass protests like the WTO. Here in Houston at the time in 2004 and 2005, after Indy Media had been around for a while, we were uh, covering the protest against the Halliburton shareholder meetings. Uh, Dick Cheney was vice president at the time, a former CEO with the company, and many times the police outnumbered protesters here uh, and were not on their best behavior. And we would do projects which would help cover those demonstrations. And just like in Seattle, we knew that we couldn't rely on the corporate media to tell the full narrative. And so uh, we were we were glad to be active. Yeah, I learned a lot about how to be a journalist through uh, being an uh, indie media member. I learned uh, all of my digital training um, and, and much about how I practice journalism today in the sense that I practice it with a purpose. Uh, I practice tactical media. And I have made great friends and relationships, lifelong relationships along the way with people like Tish. And, and Tish, uh, talk to us about some of the. You have an actual exhibition of uh, of uh, various uh, artifacts of the indie media movement over the last twenty years. Can you talk about that? Sure. Thank you again, Juan, for having us. And Amy, it's great to be here. Uh, we have an exhibition that is open now and open up through December 9th at the Rice Media Center in Houston. We made a call out to indie media activists around the country and around the world to send us things they had stored away in their own archives. We, it's a great show. Uh, interestingly, so much of what we did on indie media was digital, but what we found in what preserves in all of our archives, a lot of it is paper, newspapers, flyers, handbills, stickers, T-shirts, um, protest dresses and banners that people made. Um, we, we have a lot of video, a lot of audio mm -hmm. stations, a lot of multimedia in the exhibition. So WTO artifacts. WTO artifacts. Um, there's a lot of uh, organizing packets that were given to activists in different towns, documents on founding indie medias or how to open your own IMC. And so, yeah, we had contributions from a lot of different people, and it's really a beautiful show. It's inspiring to be around and be in. and. And it's been great to watch people walk through it and learn about Independent Media Center if they didn't already, and to be inspired. I teach at a university, so my students are going through, and it's great to see a new generation get inspired by citizen journalism and people-made media. And, Tish, you talk about IndieMedia.org and Indie Media, the Independent Media Center, as being a collective of collectives. And the significance of the open-source publishing platform that was used, that is a model today. Yes, without an army of hackers and coders who were committed to open source software, Indie Media Centers, the, the code that created them wouldn't have been invented. The massive support it took to keep these sites running on a shoestring budget and also to battle armies of trolls, which is a funny thing to say, but we really did have trouble in those days. Um, it, Independent Media Center would not have happened without an, a dedication to open source software and without an army of volunteer hackers that sort of blurred the lines between the open source movement and the independent media center movement. This was pre-WordPress. We didn't have WordPress or other websites that you could just start up. And we also didn't have social media, the idea that you could, anyone could decide what was news and publish a picture or a story. And I, I think, Tish, it would, you could argue that uh, the open publishing platform came along with the fact that we had open source software, would you say? Definitely. One, uh, they fit one within the other, open publishing, open collectives, open media, open source software, for sure. And I do want to follow up on something Rick said about how it was 
a space for collectives to come, for people to come, an open participation where we were all welcome to participate, to make media, to share media, to get training. I got my training in indie media. So many people I know did. It changed the course of our lives. And I, there's, a, there's a generation of journalists working today who have a bent for social justice media because they were trained in independent media centers. You know, when Seattle's talked about it, it shouldn't just be talked about as this is the birthplace of Microsoft and uh, Amazon, um, right? It was the largest export city, I think, in one of the largest export cities in the world. It was also Boeing. But it's the birthplace of indie media, indiemedia.org. Um, you know, Rick, you have gone on to become an Oscar nominated filmmaker. You you um, work with Jeremy Scahill on uh, Dirty Wars. You've done so many other groundbreaking films. But this um, was not your absolute start, but this model, the influence it had on you. And then I want to ask Jill about the uh, the Encuentro, the meeting you're having this weekend, the, the right there in Seattle, the, um, the remembrance that's going to be taking place. Not just a remembrance, but where do we go from here, Rick? Yeah, I mean, two things. Uh, I mean, first, that— it was the first time that I imagined that these, these changes and these movements that I'd seen around the world were possible in, in America. And I remember on the night of, of November 30th, on that Tuesday, when the National Guard came out and tear gas was everywhere, uh, and we were ordered to disperse, and people, people stayed in the streets uh, and refused to be afraid. And seeing fear break there and people reimagine themselves and their role in the world, not as just observers on the sidelines, but as participants who had the power to rewrite their history. I mean, that was a, was a fundamentally, like, was an earth-shaking revelation for me and for, I think, everyone in the street. But coming out of Seattle, we, um, uh, and we, you know, one of the things that Jill and I were thinking about were, was central to us when we were making This Is What Democracy Looks Like was this was a moment of uh, where this kind of transformation of the global economy had scarred America and had scarred the whole hemisphere. And there was this release of populist energies that uh, that we weren't the only ones who were trying to organize. Right after Seattle, Pat Buc they were, the next protests were going to be at, against the World Bank and IMF in Washington, D.C., and Pat Buchanan came out and tried to be the champion of those protests, tried to co-opt that movement and say what we're really up against, we're, it's really a nativist worker movement against these elite banker globalizers, like using all the sort of the codes of, of white supremacist nativism. And so when Jill and I were making This Is What Democracy Looks Like, we decided that we were making, would, needed to win this battle over the narrative of what defined this moment um, and, and, uh, and make, a, uh, make a film and tell a story that made it impossible to read this global movement back inside a narrow, like, Jill Freeberg, you've got the last 20 seconds. Well, one of the great things that came out of the Independent Media Center was an, was 400 hours of video, an archive that we have just reopened since Rick and I finished the film and are digitizing for preservation. And this weekend, um, David Solnit's coming up. We're going to be projecting footage from that archive onto the Washington State Convention Center. There's going to be all-day events um, reflecting on, on what happened and what we can do with those lessons today, parties. Uh, who knows what will happen with the projections? It could turn into a street party, but there's going to be um, a bunch of opportunities this weekend here in Seattle, but uh, around the world as well at other events to really we, take the lessons from what happened. We want to thank you so much all for being today. with us, Jill Freeberg, Rick Rowley, Renee Feltz, and Tish Stringer from Houston to Seattle. Here in New York, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.